I'm Chris, a park ranger, and have 11 years on my belt. Also experience comes with stories, many of which are ghost or paranormal stories. This story is true. Not going to say where I work, but it is a very large park. This story took place spring of 2008. The park that I worked at had a very big drinking problem with youths trespassing all the time. We had calls almost every night I worked nights most of my career. One day a member of the public who were camping had called and saying that there were a large group of youths making noise and drinking. I was dispatched and starting walking over in the dark. I tried to sneak up this was a breach of my standard operating procedure to try to apprehend as many as I can I managed to apprehend four or five don't clearly remember and all the others ran into the woods my prediction was that were as many as 20 people from what I saw. I radioed through to dispatch to get a couple of deputies out here to take over. Deputies arrived at this point, I was all alone in the middle of nowhere I radioed through to try to get guided back to the more civilized part of the woods at this point. I had already walked quite far and radio connection was breaking up we had bad radios back. Then as I approached a part of the woods I was similar with I looked behind me and saw someone walking up to me very slowly. I then called out, hello, no response at this point radio contact was back I radioed in saying that I have spotted someone. At this point the figure is maybe 40 meters away I then called out stop and are you okay no response. As the figure came closer it just disappeared I couldn't make out what it was. Next day came a normal day mentioned to my friend who had worked here for 10 years. I mentioned what happened and he made a scared face and said it's nothing got up and walked away. In 2013 I left to work at the sheriff's office, never mentioned to anyone except some close friends while drunk. This might not be the scariest story, but I have only had a couple of other ghost stories might put them on here later on. But this sin shivers down my spine as it is still unexplained which makes the story even scarier. But I hope this interested some of you guys, I will submit more in the future. I have tried to contact some people that have worked in similar settings to see if they have similar experience, and by the looks of it, not many people have had similar experience, except some guys in search and rescue and border patrol. Also I have read some stories of stuff like this in the UK. I might update if I have seen a similar story. I'm a park ranger named John and was driving down a remote road deep within the forest. I reached a point where the Mullicker River ran parallel to the road. Up ahead, my headlights illuminated a large, dark figure emerging from the woods and making its way onto the roadway. Approaching cautiously, I saw the figure step right in front of my car, blocking my path. I had to bring my vehicle to a sudden halt to avoid hitting this enigmatic creature. The creature before me was something out of the ordinary. It stood well over six feet tall, its body covered in wet, matted black fur. Strangely, it appeared to lack forelegs but boasted a pair of massive, powerful hind legs. As I sat there, the creature's two piercing red eyes locked onto me through the car's windshield. It lingered for a few tense moments before abruptly turning and continuing its journey across the road walking upright with a peculiar, almost robotic-like gait, eerily reminiscent of a human. Was this a dogman? I am describing my first experience that I can remember here. I believe I was 15 years old. I had gone to bed that Saturday night probably between the hours of 10 and 11 p.m. I lived in Cambridge, Ontario, Canada. My bedroom was on the top floor of our house in a turret. There was a single bed on either side of the room which was in the shape of an octagon. I woke with a start and looked over at the other bed and saw my cat sleeping there. He always did. I then looked at the clock radio which had been acting strangely over the past few weeks. It had been turning itself on and off all by itself, usually around the same time at night. Perhaps I had gotten so used to it that's why I had woken, but the time on it said it was 12.15 a.m. I tried to roll over and go back to sleep. Suddenly I found myself paralyzed on my back, unable to move. There was a tall being beside me to the left. 
The right side of my bed was up against the wall. This being was also a shadow, but its eyes glowed white. It began to communicate with me via ESP. I was somehow able to communicate back with it the same way. I do not remember everything. I do remember it asking me if I wanted to join it on its ship. Then suddenly the craft appeared by the window and green, greenish blue, and violet lights were flashing from a silver disc like UFO that was being operated by others that were in the room with me. It hovered there for several minutes. During this period of time, the shadowy being took what was to me, its index finger, and touched me on my solar plexus. I then woke in a start. My cat was not on the other bed and the clock radio said it was only midnight. I thought I had experienced a bad dream. The following morning I went to get into the shower and on my solar plexus was a marking. It remained there for a number of years and was very sensitive. It comes and goes now. When that spot on me is touched I feel as if endorphins are being released. I have had other experiences since this one such as sightings of strange things in the sky and being paralyzed in bed. Seeing strange lights flash and shadows. However, none were quite like this. I also had some inorganic materials exit my body only several months ago which I am not comfortable showing to a doctor. Man, I am so shy to share, because it really seems far-fetched. It was towards Christmas time important later and my spouse and I were hanging out at home. I looked up still in the house and saw him standing there. He looked just like the stereotypical garden gnome, red cap, beard and all. My memory is that his eyes got a little wide when he saw me looking, and he gave me what seemed like a jaunty little wave and a smile. Anyway, I turned to get my spouse's attention to see if he could see it too, and when I looked back he disappeared. I searched the whole house trying to prove to myself that I didn't imagine it. My spouse, being Norwegian, believes it was a tauntiness, which is why I mention it being Christmas time. I've questioned myself thousands of times since, but I wasn't asleep, impaired in any way or have a tendency to hallucinate. One reason we might have attracted one if it was real is that we've always left a plate out for any creatures on New Year's Eve, typically a sweet, a little pickled herring and a drink of some sort, just to be friendly. I usually leave out a needle and thread as well so they could repair their clothes. In the morning I take the remains outside for scavengers. I kind of saw it as a harmless little tradition that my husband's family does, but I'm a little more deliberate about not forgetting to leave it out these days. So. That's my story, I'm not convinced that it's logical in any way, but I do like the idea of there being a little magic left in this world. True story. This happened about 20 years ago, and it still gives me the willies I had invited a few friends over one night after work for a couple of beers and we were just hanging out vibing and jiving some philosophy around the coffee table in the living room. I was somewhat absent-mindedly spinning a quarter 25 cent piece as the conversation progressed. I proposed an interesting question to my friends. How many sides does a coin have? A coin has two sides, of course, was the first response. Actually, that is incorrect, I retorted. Then I stopped the coin from spinning and flicked it one more time to let it spin again as I explained. A coin has three sides, the front, back, and the thinnest side being the edge or thickness of the coin. As I explained this, we all watched the coin slow down, and gradually it stopped spinning, only for it to stop perfectly balanced on its edge. The third side. We were all totally dumbstruck. It seemed too impossible to all be a coincidence. I have tried to make this happen again ever since, and I've never been successful. What do you guys think? We stayed at Lake George Battlefield Campground. Our last night camping was Sunday, July 16, this year, 2023. Right after midnight, my friends went to use the bathroom and left me alone by the fire when I heard a woman's voice singing in the woods. It was spooky, but also dreamlike. I describe it as singing because it sounded so practiced, 
but it was arpeggiated notes, no words. Would also describe it as sad and possibly ritualistic. Startled, I tried to record it because it was definitely audible. Figured if my ears can pick it up, so can a mic. No chance. I responded with vocals of my own and then asking who was there. No response. My friends returned about ten minutes later and the singing stopped as I heard their footsteps approaching from the road. They told me it was bullfrogs. The pitch changes and length of the notes was no way a bullfrog forest animal. For reference, the campsite we stayed was 200 feet south of the Isak Jogs Monument. There is a nature trail about 400 feet west, down the hill from our site. In front of the nature trail is the Tiki Hotel. We can see those lights through the foliage. I'm really thinking it was a someone practicing some Native American ritual. We've stayed at the same campsite every year for the past five, but this is our first time staying into Monday morning. Would anybody know what goes on out there on Sundays? Hiking in Virginia two days in and 20 plus miles from anything. In the middle of the night, while we were sitting around the campfire, we hear a major commotion coming down the ridge above our trail. Out of nowhere, some guy hauls ass by our sight, wearing a jogging suit and small kid-sized backpack. Two minutes later, two other guys come down the hill from the same place, no trail, both leading German Shepherd and dressed in FBI-type clothing. I'm thinking we were close to some hillbilly pot fields. Also, the brown mountain lights in NC are pretty odd. Years ago, around a decade back, my friend and I were part of the same Marine Corps Reserve Unit. The distance to our unit from my place was a good two hours. One particular day, we were required to report early. To save time, we decided I'd stay at his place, situated halfway between my home and the drill center. After a night of barracks cuts and a couple of beers, my friend, looking a bit troubled, confided in me about an unusual problem with the house he was renting. He believed it was haunted by a ghost. I, being a skeptic, couldn't help but tease him. But his response was not what I expected. He looked straight into my eyes and uttered, It's a damn cat. He recounted incidents where he'd wake up to see the cat lounging outside his bedroom. Each time he would leap out of bed to catch it, but by the time he'd reached the doorway just five, seven feet away, it would vanish. I laughed it off, attributing it to his imagination, and decided to crash on the living room couch. The stillness of the night was interrupted when I felt something brushing against my hand, which dangled off the couch. As I peered down, I was met with the sight of a cat affectionately rubbing its head against my hand. Panic set in as I realized I was paralyzed the dreaded sleep paralysis. While my body was immobile, my willpower drove me to make a tiny movement. In a desperate attempt to prove its existence, I managed to grip the cat's face with my index finger, trying to nick my finger on its sharp tooth. Suddenly, the cat wrenched free and darted straight through the living room wall. The moment its tail disappeared, the paralysis lifted. Frantically, I inspected my finger. While there was no visible injury, I could faintly feel where the tooth had pressed against it, and there seemed to be a slight discoloration. The next day, still bewildered, I narrated the previous night's events to my friend. I may never know the truth of that night, but part of me is convinced I held on to a ghostly feline, even if just for a fleeting moment. The most uncanny thing, it behaved just like any ordinary cat. I've been a biologist ever since I was 22 years old. I grew up on a farm in rural Illinois, so nature has never been a stranger to me. Playing in the woods was how I entertained myself growing up. Spending all my time in a forest as a child, people expect me to have stories about Bigfoot or strange noises or finding some weird shrine out in the middle of the woods, but no. The weirdest thing I ever encountered was a bobcat screeching. It sounds just like a woman's dying scream, and yes, to everyone who's ever claimed to hear a skinwalker or goatman screeching in the woods at night, I promise you, it was just a bobcat. 
the truth is often mundane and disappointing. You'd think this would mean I'd have gotten bored of the woods, but I never really lost my love for them. Nature is boring. That's why I like it. You know what to expect. That's why, after college, I decided to make studying nature my full-time career. I'm a biologist for the Sierra Club, specialized in the ecosystems of Midwestern America. Fish, birds, deer, elk, bear, wolves, the like. I've spent weeks in fire towers, cabins, campsites, always miles away from civilization. I'm usually gathering data on local wildlife, measuring for pollutants, determining whether the ecosystem is stable or if anything threatens it. The work is not glamorous, but I enjoy it. And nature had still never surprised me. Until my last assignment. I was designated to be stationed alone in a cabin in the Ozarks. The assignment was supposed to last last three weeks in May. The Sierra Club was alerted to a steady decline in the local elk population over the last decade. Nothing drastic, but enough to raise concern. My job was to take census of the wildlife, measure for pollutants, the usual. These are my diary entries for my assignment, starting with my first night. I arrived in the evening in early May. Nothing was amiss the first two nights. It seemed an assignment like any other. The sounds of the forest were exactly what you'd expect. Crickets, an owl's hoot, and the occasional elk call. I was sent here in May because that's their mating season. The elk are out and about looking for, uh, dates, and that makes them easy to count. Elk mating is pretty straightforward. The female lets out a call and waits for a male to find her. Usually it's first come, first served, if you catch my drift. If only right, it was clear that love was in the air, and for all the calling, you'd think I would start seeing elk. But by the second day, I still hadn't spotted a single one. The third night, I was lying awake in bed uneasy. Something wasn't sitting right with me, but I couldn't put my finger on why. I was about to nod off when a female call cut through the night. I sighed. That was the second time that night I'd heard her. What, are the fellas having a guy's night in or something? And that's when it finally hit me. I shot bolt upright in bed. For the last three nights, I had heard nothing but female mating calls. That should have drawn every male within half a mile. Now elk are not discreet, and they don't beat around the bush. When that male gets to the female. Well, let's just that the whole forest will know about it. I sat in bed, staring out into the night, pondering. There have to be males close enough to hear this female. So after three nights of her calls, why haven't I heard the main event? The third day, I went out onto the trails, once again looking for some sign of elk in the forest. What I found was not encouraging. About a quarter mile from my cabin, I was trekking down the trail when I noticed something 30 feet into the woods. A large brown fuzzy mass lying in the brush. I smiled an elk taking a midday nap. I took out my binoculars to get a closer look. It was an elk, all right. But my smile dropped when I realized that the brown fuzzy mass was completely still. I carry a hunting rifle with me for safety. I readied it and approached the elk carefully. It looked fine from where I was standing, but I nearly dropped my rifle when I rounded to the animal's front. It was carnage. The poor creature had been completely gutted, what little remained of its entrails hung loosely out of its chest cavity. The ribs had been pulled apart, and huge claw marks scarred its flank. Its head was barely connected to its body by a few weak strands of flesh. I heaved and almost lost what little breakfast I'd had. It was horrifying. I had to take a few moments to collect myself. This was the first time that nature had surprised me. What could have possibly done this? I've studied wildlife for years. This was a bull elk in its prime. It would have stood nine feet tall alive, a king of the forest. There is no predator on this continent that could have taken down a full-grown bull, pack or no pack. Even a grizzly wouldn't mess with something this big. And bears are mostly scavengers anyway. My mind raced through possibilities, trying to think of an explanation. Maybe it had been sick. Maybe a predator came upon it in its sleep, took it by surprise. Yes, that must be it. It couldn't have fought back. But this savagery, 
Those claw marks were bigger than even a grizzly's, and its ribs. No quadruped could have exerted leverage on the ribs to split them like that. You would need arms. A chilling thought occurred. A human? Could humans have done this? But why? Hunters would skin it or take the head at least to mount on their wall. Is some psychopath out here dismembering wildlife for fun? And that still wouldn't explain those gruesome claws. Whatever this was, it needed to be reported. I was sent here to investigate the elk population declining, and this had to be related. I fished out my camera to take photos. Having to document the horror from every angle was heart-wrenching. The look in its eyes. This elk had been terrified when it died. I went to take one last shot. Just as the shutter clicked, my ears registered something. A sound from behind me that my camera had nearly drowned out. I whipped around. I had barely heard it, but it was there. A twig snapping. My camera hung from my neck and my rifle from my shoulder. I dropped the one to snatch up the other. Idiot, I thought to myself as I pointed the rifle towards the sound. I had been so shaken by the sight of the body I had completely overlooked one important fact. The kill was fresh. This corpse hadn't even begun to decay. This elk had been dead no more than half a day, and that means whatever killed it may still be nearby. With my rifle still trained on the spot, I backed away towards the trail. My hike back to the cabin was the only time in my life I felt scared of the forest. Trees surrounding me on all sides, no visibility. I jumped at the slightest sounds, never lowering my rifle, never going more than five seconds without looking behind me. I felt like prey, never knowing where the danger would come from or when. I didn't relax until my cabin door was closed and locked behind me. I spent the rest of my day inside the cabin shaken. I readied the photos and sent them to my supervisors. They would take a day or two to respond. Until then, my plan was to investigate. During the day, and with my rifle ready, that night was my last night at the cabin. I was getting ready for bed when I heard a female elk call again. The first one that I'd heard that day, and close, very close. Wildlife don't like buildings. They smell of fire and metal and gasoline, all unnatural to them. They steer clear. What was this elk doing so close to my cabin? I peered out my window into the dark of the forest. No sign of her. She must have been beyond the tree line. I grabbed my rifle. Of course, I wasn't going to shoot the elk. But I might send a few shots into the air to scare her off. It would be nice to know the elk are breeding normally, but I could do without front row seats. I unlocked my cabin and took a step out onto my porch, rifle still in hand. My eyes scanned the tree line, looking for the female. That's when a pair of antlers struck out from behind a tree. An elk's head followed them and turned peer right out at me. But this was a buck, probably attracted by the female's calls. This was promising, but all the more reason to scare them away. I raised my rifle to the sky and prepared to fire. That was when the elk flew into the air, or its head did. The buck's head sailed in an arc towards me and landed just feet away from my door. I stood there in shock trying to process what had just happened. Something, something or someone had been holding the head and had just thrown it. I nearly pissed myself in fear. I pointed my rifle at the tree where the buck's head had appeared. The light from my cabin barely reached. Were my eyes playing tricks on me? Had I just seen claws retreat around the trunk? I was frozen. I needed to reach behind me to open my door and get back inside but I was too scared to turn my back on the forest, or even take a hand off of my rifle. After a few seconds, I finally gathered up the nerve to brace the rifle against my shoulder, my finger still on the trigger. I groped behind me until my left hand found the doorknob, never taking my eyes off the tree. Thank God the door had not locked behind me. With my left hand, I turned the knob and pushed open the door, then drew it back to my rifle. I backed away quickly into the cabin, slamming the door and locking it. I hurried to the windows, drawing all my blinds and making sure each was locked, never letting my rifle out of arm's reach. 
The terror I felt as I approached each window, never knowing if there would be someone or something on the other side of the glass staring back at me. There hadn't been, which was almost as unnerving. I rushed to the satellite phone to call the sheriff's office at the base of the mountain. The relief I felt when they picked up. You need to get up here, I pleaded. Who is this? It was the sheriff's deputy on the other end. I'd met him and the sheriff before beginning my stay at the cabin. It's me. I'm the guy stationed up at the cabin on the mountain. Oh, sorry about that. What's the problem? There's someone up here messing with me. Get up here now. Whoa, whoa, slow down. You mean like kids or something? No, it is not kids. Someone up here just threw a decapitated elk head at my cabin. In my panic, I'd somehow kept the awareness to use the phrase, someone instead of something. I didn't want this guy to think I was drunk or crazy. I just needed him to get up here. Well, what did they look like? How many were there? Did they have guns? I have no idea, man. They killed a god of elk, cut the head off, and threw it at my cabin. Just get the hell up here. Oh shit, okay, okay, lock yourself in there. We're on our way. Man, please stay on the line. I'm scared here. I really was terrified. I wanted someone to stay on the phone with me, even if it couldn't help me. The man replied, I can't get to you and stay on the line at the same time. I'm calling the sheriff now. We're on our way. Just lock yourself in and stay there. The man hung up. I swore. I was alone again. A female elk call rang out again. This time it was even closer. It sounded like it was right outside now. I took up my rifle again. That's when the tapping started. While I was talking to the deputy, I hadn't been watching the windows. The sound was coming from the window to the right of my front door. My eyes widened in horror. A single gray claw was tapping on the right edge of the window. Just one claw. Whatever it was attached to wanted to stay out of sight. The claw stopped tapping. Instead, it drew itself along the window and out of my sight, leaving a long, ugly scratch. The sound was horrible. But it didn't stop when it left the window. I could still hear it, dragging along the wooden walls of my cabin. The creature was scratching through solid wood. Could it break through my windows? Why didn't it? My knees shook. I tracked the sound of the scratching with my rifle. My mind raced. Could this thing get in? How long until the sheriff showed up? I was high up on the mountain. The drive up here took 45 minutes. Even if they hurried, it might be a half hour. Even if they did get here, could they stop this thing? Should I make a run for my truck? No. Whatever that thing was, it could get to me before I got the truck up and running. Something nagged at the back of my head, but I could barely think. The scratching was louder and louder. Whatever this thing was, it had torn a bull elk to shreds. How could I stop it? The bull. That's when I realized it. The head. It was the same head as the bull I'd seen earlier. It had the same scar down its right cheek. This thing was taunting me. It must have been there when I found the dead elk. It had been watching me, and now it had thrown the head at me. Was it telling me to go away? To get out of its territory? I gasped. With my mind racing, I hadn't noticed that the scratching had stopped. Where was that thing? My eyes darted from window to window. No sign of it. Until the loud thud right above me. It's on the goddamn roof, I thought. Its footsteps echoed through my cabin. Between each step came rhythmic taps, no doubt from its claws. Was it testing for weaknesses? Was it merely toying with me? It had only been a few minutes since I called the sheriff's office. I was still far from safety. I hadn't moved since the call. The thing on my roof thudded from spot to spot. The shock was starting to wear off. Focus. Think. I told myself. The thing had probably seen me through my window. It was right above me. The bathroom. The bathroom was the safest spot. There were no windows. If it does break in, it will have to look for me, then break through the bathroom door. That might buy me an extra minute, and it might save my life. The creature knew where I was. I had to try to change that. I slowly slipped off my shoes. Keeping my rifle trained on the roof, 
I kicked a shoe towards my bed. Sure enough, the thuds on my roof followed, stopping right above the spot where my shoe had landed. It's tracking me. I slowly shuffled to the bathroom, not raising my feet, afraid to make a sound. Praying that the door would not creak, I opened the bathroom, preparing to lock myself inside. I was shutting myself in, hoping that I wouldn't die in this bathroom, when I heard a loud scratch, followed by a dull thud. It had jumped off the roof. It was on the ground again, outside the cabin. Why? Was it going away? I was afraid to hope that maybe it had gotten bored. Maybe it had found some other prey. That was when I heard the woman scream. I gasped and covered my mouth. How was that possible? No one else is up here. A hiker, a camper maybe. The scream came again. Help, she cried out. I gripped my rifle, crying now. I was frozen in fear. That thing was out there, chasing some poor woman, and I was too cowardly to help her. I just wanted to stay in that bathroom, hiding, hoping that every second the thing spent chasing that woman was another second closer to the sheriff getting here. I don't know how long I sat there, cowering. Another, more desperate scream. Help me. There was something in her terror. She was more scared than I was. And there I sat, letting her die. My shame overcame my fear. I gripped my rifle tighter and left the bathroom. I marched to the door, ready to face whatever this creature was. Maybe I could distract it. Buy time for her to get away. Maybe the sheriff would find her, even if the thing got me first. Just as I was reaching for the doorknob, she cried out again. A pained, dying scream. I was too late. That thing had gotten to her. I was a coward. And because of that, she was dead. The woman moaned in pain, this time just a few meters away from my door. This must be her final moments. And I listened, safe in my cabin. She groaned once more. But this sounded different somehow. It was. My eyes widened in shock and realization. I drew my hand from the doorknob as if it had burned me. I had never unlocked it. Thank God. The moan came again. This time, unmistakable. That was not a moan of pain or terror. It was an entirely different kind of moaning. I backed away from the door. You mother F, I muttered. You almost got me. It all made sense now. There never was any female elk. Mimicry is a common adaptation in all ecosystems, both for prey and for predators. This thing, it let out female elk cries to draw in males. And then, well, I had already seen the result in the forest. That's why I never heard the elk mating. There was no female waiting for them. Only this monster. And now it was trying the same tactic on me. I nearly sobbed in terror. It had tried to lure me with the sound of a woman in distress. It thought that might draw me out. When that didn't work, it switched to its tried and true method. A mating call. I aimed my rifle at the door. The moans continued, louder and more intense, building into a climax. I was nauseous at the thought of whatever it was out there, squatting in the dark, mouth agape, emitting this perversion of a woman's voice, trying to draw me out into the dark and rip me apart just like that elk. I stood with my rifle trained at the door, not moving. I had resolved that I was going to stand there until the sun rose or until the sheriff came. And the moment I saw this thing, I was going to shoot it. I don't know how long I stood there among the echoes of that sick creature. Eventually, the moans puttered out, and I was left in silence. Until the tapping began again. In the same spot as before. There it was. That single gray claw, tapping on that same spot where it had scratched the glass. But then a second claw joined it. Then a third. It drummed them along the glass. Slowly ever so slowly. A patch of gray fur poked out from the edge of the window. Time stopped, and the creature brought its face into full view. It was terrible, like a sloth, but its mouth and nose were caked in blood. It had tiny, beady eyes front-facing, a predator's eyes, large, pointed ears almost like a bat, thin, cracked lips. The monster looked right into my eyes. It cocked its head, and then, it pulled those terrible, bloody lips back into a smile. 
its razor-sharp teeth still stained with blood and flesh. I'll never forget them. It pointed that hideous grin at me as it drummed those claws on my window. Shoot, 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 I told myself. But I was frozen. This thing was going to kill me. Light poured through the front window. The monster disappeared out of sight. The sheriff and deputy had arrived in their truck. The two of them sauntered up to my porch and knocked. I had to shake myself out of my stupor and open the door. Both of them backed off and drew their weapons at me, screaming at me to put the gun down. I was still in shock. I think the only thing that kept them from shooting me was the terrified look in my eyes. They asked me what the hell was going on. I could barely speak. I just kept frantically repeating that they needed to get inside, that it was still out there. They eventually told me to come with them down to the sheriff's station. At first, I refused to leave the cabin. They sort of half dragged, half walked me to the truck. They said I was like an owl the whole ride down, my head on a swivel, always scanning the tree line for it. I must have fallen asleep after I got to the station. I woke up the next morning in a cell. I was confused and disoriented. I nearly wept from fear when I finally remembered everything I had been through the night before. The sheriff and deputy sat me down in a room and asked me what the hell happened that night. I was silent at first. I didn't know what to tell them. If I told the truth, they'd think I was crazy. They asked me about the elk's head that I'd told them about during the call. It was gone when they got there. Just a bloody stain on the ground where it had been lying. I made up a story. Said that some kids were prowling around my cabin, making noises, trying to scare me. I called the sheriff's office because I thought I saw one of them with a gun. The sheriff only made me go over the story once. He seemed satisfied. He took me back up there the next day to collect my stuff. In broad daylight, of course. Sure enough, there were deep scratch marks along the side of the cabin. The sheriff didn't look at me. Kids, he said. We collected my things quickly and hurried back down the mountain. I reported to my supervisors that it was probably overhunting causing the population decline. They would never believe the truth. The sheriff saw me off while I was waiting for the bus to take me back home. He shook my hand and drew me in for one of them manly half-hugs. He gripped my shoulder. Don't come back. He whispered. I gave him a confused look. He stared me right in the eyes. It knows you now. Has your scent. Seen your face. Heard your voice. You got away once. It won't happen again, so don't ever come back. That was years ago. I burned the clothes that I had worn that trip, so there's no way they'd end up near the Ozarks again. Never been back anywhere near the Ozarks. And anyone who's ever asked me, I always tell them to steer clear. I've spent so much time trying to forget what I saw that night. But that face, I remember every detail. It's kept me up so many nights with so many questions. What the hell was it? Some freak of nature, a mutant that somehow survived past infancy. Something supernatural. An alien? Those ears. Perfectly crafted to detect minute sounds just like a bat. That explains its mimicry. It grew up in that forest, hearing the elk calls. After a while, it learned to copy them. I've spent so many nights asking myself, how? How did it know a woman's voice? I dread to ponder the answer. When sleep finally comes, I have nightmares. Nightmares about campers sitting around their fire, when all of a sudden they hear a voice calling out to them from the woods, crying for help. The voice in my nightmares, calling them into the darkness of the trees, away from the safety of their fire. The voice, my voice. One day last week, a marvelous apparition was seen near Kenai Island. At the height of at least a thousand feet in the air, a strange object was in the act of flying toward the New Jersey coast. It was apparently a man with bat's wings and improved frog's legs. The face of the man could be distinctly seen, and it wore a cruel and determined expression. The movements made by the object closely resembled those of a frog in the act of swimming with his hind legs and flying with his front legs. 
Of course, no respectable frog has ever been known to conduct himself in precisely that way. But were a frog to wear bat's wings and to attempt to swim and fly at the same time, he would correctly imitate the conduct of the Kenai Island monster. When we add that this monster waved his wings in answer to the whistle of a locomotive and was of a deep black color, the alarming nature of the apparition can be imagined. The object was seen by many reputable persons, and they all agree that it was a man engaged in flying toward New Jersey. About a month ago, an object of precisely the same nature was seen in the air over St. Louis by a number of citizens who happen to be sober and are believed to be trustworthy. A little later, it was seen by various Kentucky persons as it flew across the state. In no instance has it been known to alight, and no one has seen it at a lower elevation than a thousand feet above the surface of the earth. It is without a doubt the most extraordinary and wonderful object that has ever been seen, and there should be no time lost in ascertaining its precise nature, habits, and probable mission. That this aerial apparition is a man fitted with practicable wings, there is no reason to doubt. Someone has solved the problem of aerial navigation by inventing wings with which a man can sustain himself in the air and direct his flight to any desired point. Who is this adventurous flyer and what is his object? Are questions of immediate and enormous importance. Of course, the first impulse of the unreflecting mind will be to exclaim that the mysterious flyer is an aeronaut who has invented practicable wings and is secretly experimenting with them before making his invention public. This is directly at variance with the known habits and customs of aeronauts. Had any aeronaut invented a pair of wings he would have advertised, long before his invention was perfected, that he was in possession of a machine wherewith to make an aerial voyage to Europe in 24 hours, and that he was prepared to exhibit it for a few weeks to everyone who would pay 50 cents to see it. A little later, he would have taken up a subscription to pay the expenses of his proposed voyage in the interests of science, and would probably have published a book on the science of aeronautics. Then he would have suddenly disappeared, taking his wings with him or accidentally burning them, and after the first outburst of indignation on the part of a swindled public, would have been totally forgotten. This has been the invariable practice of these ingenious aeronauts who have claimed to be the inventors of balloons or other apparatus capable of navigating the air. That the mysterious flying man has not followed this custom makes it perfectly clear that he is not a professional aeronaut. Beyond any question, either the flying man or some scientific person at present unknown has invented the bat's wings and frog's legs with which the flying man now sails through the air. Why has not the inventor patented his invention and had himself duly written up by the press? The reason is obvious. The flying man is engaged in some undertaking which he cannot safely proclaim. In other words, he is an aerial criminal, a fact which explains the cruelty and determination visible on his countenance. And what can be the nefarious object which this probable wretch has in view? It cannot be simply theft and robbery for it would manifestly be impossible for him, in his flying costume, to perpetrate burglary or highway robbery, or to pick pockets. It cannot be plumbing, for obvious reasons, neither can it be the sale of books published by subscription only. Yet the flying villain must have an object, and we have a right to assume that only a peculiarly nefarious object could induce a man to fly to New Jersey or St. Louis in hot weather, and without an umbrella or mosquito net. It has not escaped notice that of late Mr. Talmadge has been wandering in the West in search of entertaining varieties of crime wherewith to embellish his sermons. It is also known that he returned to this city just before the flying man of Kenai Island was seen. Now, if there is a man in this country whose arms and legs are fitted to endure the muscular strain inseparable from the act of flying, that man is Mr. Gazager Talmadge. He has preached for years with those graceful limbs, and must have developed and hardened their muscles to an extent which would fill every other professional acrobat with envy. What is more probable than that Mr. Talmadge has equipped himself with wings in order to study interesting types of immorality from the lofty height of a thousand feet? He has flown over St. Louis and Kentucky precisely the places which might be expected to yield a rich reward to an investigator of crime, and he is now flying to and fro over Kenai Island, 
preparatory to preaching a scathing sermon on the wickedness and indecencies of our bathing resorts. Here we have a natural and probable explanation of the flying man, and it is earnestly to be hoped that no one, with mistaken zeal for field sports, will attempt to shoot the preacher on the wing with a shotgun. There is not a shotgun in existence which will do any good at a distance of a thousand feet. When I had 16 years old, I was in my friend's house watching a movie, and after I come back to my house, walking on the street normally. It was 1.30 a.m. when I arrival in my house, I gone to my room and go front the mirror. I didn't turn on the light in this moment, I used my phone's flashlight. So in this exactly moment I saw a pale man behind me, with straight black hair, looking at me for 3-5 seconds and I could felt my skin creeps like never before in my whole life. I was so scarred with this, I couldn't sleep well in this night. I had overthinking in this thing for few years, but couldn't found something about it. I don't what is it. On September 18th, an unsettling incident unfolded involving my dad's friend and a terrifying creature known as the Dogman. This creature had brutally killed his 130-pound dog. The dog had a poignant backstory, as it was a gift from his wife's late uncle. Before his passing, the uncle had entrusted her with the dog, and she had promised to care for it. One night, the dog's instincts kicked in, sensing a looming danger. It began barking incessantly, indicating a perceived threat. Despite their efforts, the dog managed to escape from their home. Tragically, the following morning revealed a grim sight. The lifeless body of the dog lay on their porch, its entrails savagely torn apart. In response, Justin, the dad's friend, moved the dog's remains to another location, intending to return later to bury it. However, upon his return, he was met with confusion and disbelief the dog's body had disappeared without a trace. Seeking answers, he reviewed the footage from his trail camera and was met with a chilling revelation the camera had captured images of the dogman itself. Unfortunately, I don't possess the actual pictures of the dogman. The incident left Justin's wife profoundly distraught, grappling with the loss of their beloved pet and the unsettling encounter with the enigmatic dogman. I have lived in Florida almost my entire life, and right now I live in Central Florida, so this is terrifying. When I was about eight, we rented a place that was on one of the main streets of our town. Without being too specific, this was in Pinellas County. My brother and I would walk our dog down the main road, and occasionally we would see a dead animal. We would just assume that it was roadkill from the night before. It was always opossums and raccoons, so this was the most logical conclusion. This went on for weeks, maybe months. As time went on, there were more and more dead animals, and we noticed they were always in one yard. As time went on, we noticed the animals got more and more exotic. For example, one time there was a dead snapping turtle. This would not have been roadkill in the area because there wasn't water around this specific area, and we had never seen this type of turtle nearby. So whoever lived there had been slowly collecting more dead animals as time went on. It was freaky shit, especially for an eight and six year old. We eventually told our parents and some other family, and my grandma brushed it off by saying that in her old neighborhood, people would nail dead animals to trees, so this wasn't a big deal. Still weird and oddly out in the open on this large road. It is still creepy to think that this was going on so close to home. And now, after your story, the feeling is back. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.